Well, we're happy to have Brother Warren back with us today. Looking forward to his message. Let's give the Lord a hand this morning. Would you talk to Tim a little bit? <laughs> so I said, I'll have to change my message. <laughs> and I got to thinking that would take so long, I'd have to study and study. <laughs> oh, I love Tim. We have great times on prayer line on Tuesday nights. Feel the Holy Ghost. Great move of God sometimes. <laughs> And uh, I love that. Uh, aren't you glad that God led them here? Yeah. Well, that's an answer yeah. for everybody. Yeah. 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 Brother Don, I tell you how, what a blessing it is to have somebody doing music before you get up here. Yeah. It really helps. Praise God. And I know Kevin would agree because he comes up and speaks after they're here and, and when they get up. And so I, I, I'm glad they're, they're here at the station. And, and Lord willing, a week from this Thursday, going to be at the little church. And they're going to uh, uh, be singing, and Tim's going to be preaching, and uh, uh, I'm giving my notice before he ever does, because that's all I've just seen it. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm looking forward to it, praise God. Uh, I told Tim and Paul, I said, we'd like for you to come, but i got one problem. He said, what? I said, well, we've only got one electrical plug in the whole church. <laughs> And I just knew this. They'll say, "Well, for the Lord, we're sorry, but we got our equipment. You know, it's too much for one." One, uh, but anyway, he said, "No." I, and it was a blessing. He said that they had him working on this thing. He's got this box of plugging in one plug, and they can do all the singing and stuff. And so we're looking forward to have them and having them at the church and praise God. And, and I told the people over there that they were coming. They got so excited. And I, began, I started thinking, I said, are they excited that they're coming or excited that they're going to get to hear somebody else? So, no, they're looking forward to it. And I, I, I really just kid with Paul and Tim, that they're precious, precious folks. And I, I'm glad to know them. Aren't you glad to know the people that God's put in your life? Aren't you glad? God said, for every, for every friend you lose when you get saved, I'll give you a hundred to take your place. Y'all can testify to that, but you see, you know hundreds of people. So did Brother Donnie, he knows hundreds of people. I'm, uh, I'll, when I'm around him, I hear him talking. He doesn't know I'm listening, but I'm listening. And he says, talk to this one on the phone, tell his wife, or that one, or that one. And I think, boy, he's always on the phone, knows so many people. And it's all because the Lord's doing all this. All I'm starting with this. Praise God. Well, I better get to talking because my missus is only an hour today and it's 20 till right now. Praise God. I don't think too many people in a hurry to get out in that rain right now, so let's let it keep raining more till I can but stop talk with I don't know. We might stop tonight. We're coming up on a, a time that for me is a, uh, one of the most important times of the year for me as a Christian. Two weeks from today is Easter. And for me, there's uh, two great days when it comes to Christianity each year. And that's Christmas and Easter. And uh, Easter is important to me because it's, it's the end of what God sent Jesus to do. He said to do all that he done, and uh, and but at the end, at the resurrection, that culminated everything that God sent His Son to do. And at the end of that time, everything was different. Before the resurrection.
resurrection, the enemy had a power and a control and ability to, to, uh, to come against people and affect people's lives that he didn't have after Easter. Easter. The day that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. The day that he conquered death. The day that he he put an exclamation point on what Tim said earlier, that one day death would be done away with. And I was just reading just a few days ago in the book of Revelation, and I love to stop on the places where it, it emphasizes something that I like, and, and I was reading about how hell and death would be thrown into the lake of fire forever, and death would no longer ever exist again. I thank the Lord for turning my hand for that. He's the one that's doing it. And he's the one that's going to get rid of it, get to finally do away with death. And I'm looking forward to that. But I got I, I got a joy in my heart today though that's that's concerning death. Because you see, Kevin, my Lord and Savior has told me that it's a believer in me. And you're trusting me for your salvation. You're never going to die. Amen. Now most of us think of death, most people do, as you see that, that body drop and it's no longer functioning. But that's not death. For the Christian, that's liberation. Amen. That's liberation, being liberated by the Lord. And for me, Jesus said, and, and I think it's in John the 11th chapter, I think it was, he said, uh, if anyone believes in me, if a man believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And if a man lives and believes in me, he shall never die. See, I'm not going to die. My son's here with me today. I'm so glad he is. Uh, he, he means so much to me because he's one of my children that are following the Lord with all of his heart. And, uh, and I got to watch what I do and say because he's filming me in and so uh, it's probably, I, I don't know how good it's going to burn out, but, but I, I have victory in my heart today because I don't look at this life. You know, I'm not looking at this life. The Bible says in this world, Jesus said in this world, you'll have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I will overcome the world. And uh, so I don't have defeat today. I have victory through the Lord. Now, that doesn't mean that times don't come that you don't feel like, Lord, what's happening here? What's going to, how's this going to end up? How's it going to turn out? You know? But uh, I have victory in the Lord and Savior Jesus today. He came to the tomb of Lazarus. Mary and Martha were distraught. They had lost someone that was so important to them. Lazarus, the Bible said, Jesus loved Lazarus. I mean, he loved him. It was a special bond there between him. And I think it was because Lazarus was a man after God's heart like David in a sense that he wanted to serve God, live for God. Yeah. And, and Jesus loved that. And, and anyway, uh, he came to where Lazarus was. And uh, Martha said, Lord, if you'd have been here, my brother, our brother wouldn't have died. And he says he'll live again. Amen. Now I'm going to have to hold myself down because it might take off around these views, but uh, he said he'll live again at the resurrection. She said, I know that he will live again at the resurrection. He, he'll be resurrected. And I, I don't know, I'd just like for a moment to be there when Jesus looked at her and said, Martha, I am the resurrection. You're talking to the resurrection. You're talking to the ones about to bring your brother out of the grave. I'm going to show you I'm the, I am the resurrection. Lazarus! Come forth! One of these days, 
God's going to say, go get my children. And Jesus is going to get up and go to the door and open it and say, come forth! Before he can get that last little silver out, in a split second, every one of us is saved. He's going to be called to with him. Praise God! Praise God! Praise God! The last seven things that Jesus said on the cross. Jesus had just come from all that he'd been through. Suffering a horrendous beating. Um, and I know that, that other people is going to speak before Easter. That they will have an Easter message, I'm sure. So I didn't want to get too much in. I wanted to leave some for him. But uh, uh, when Jesus was in the garden and was going through all the pain that he was, sweating drops as of blood. Um, and he went through after that, they come and arrested him, he took him and went through all the this mockery of a trial and all that was done. And finally, they've got him at, on the cross. And Jesus had seven things to say. The first three things he said were between nine o'clock in the morning when he was crucified until and twelve noon. And then the rest of what he said was from twelve noon to three. Now those are two separated times. If you notice what he says, the first three things before the twelve o'clock, it's a lot different than the last four things he had to say. Because at twelve things begin to get dark. And the sky began to darken and things began to happen. That sky getting a lot dark represented something that was happening to Jesus. But one of the things Jesus said, the first thing he said was, Father, forgive them, Amen. for they know not what they do. That's found in Luke 23, 34. Father, forgive them, for they don't they know not what they do. Jesus did at that very moment what he had told his disciples to do in Matthew chapter 5 verse 44 when he gave the Sermon on the Mount. Remember? Read all the scriptures. And, uh, and he said this. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. I don't know what my reaction would be if somebody decided to crucify me or hurt me some other way, torture me some other way. But Jesus had told his followers, he said, love your enemy. Amen. I'm going to tell you sometimes that's not easy. But I found out where it's easy. And I found out why we can't do it most of the time. And I'm going to be honest with you. You know, like the Lord been lately been dealing and said, you got away from your preaching as you used to preach. And because sin is not being preached again, because sin is not being uh, talked about and, 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 and been uh, let people know that God doesn't tolerate sin, the sin has got into the church. It's in the church. And people are perishing in the church. Because they're not hearing the truth. They're hearing the gospel that makes them feel good or doesn't disturb them. I know of a church right now today that will have a packed house today. And some of those people that's in there will be homosexual couples. That's been coming for years. And never convicted about the sin they're in. Some of them is going to be people who are living together outside of wedlock. Now, I know there may be people here today like that, but I want to tell you, it's just as much sin today as it was back then when, when Jesus said, we, and God's word says we're not supposed to do it. No fornicator shall enter the kingdom of God. Amen. No adulterer shall enter the kingdom of God. And he tells us that in the word in, in, in several places. I don't want to get off on that because that's a whole sermon and I don't want to get off on that. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. That was 
Jesus showing us that he did exactly what he told us we need to do. Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. And we're supposed to love our enemies. And how, how can I do that? I found out that when my life is committed to God and surrendered to God, and I'm making a strong effort to stay close to the Lord, I can do things in him that I can't do outside myself without him. I can love people that normally I wouldn't even make no effort to love if I was out in the world or I didn't have nothing to do with them. But if I live close to the Lord and I want what he wants, why should I love, should I love my enemies? Because Jesus said to do it. And that's all it should take. Because he's supposed to be our Lord and Savior. And we soon find out if he really is or not. When we, in the way we react to people and things we say and do. If he's Lord, you will want to love your enemy. Yeah. I want to love my enemy. Yeah. Not because I love them. Yeah. <laughs> I don't like what they're doing. I don't like what they do to people. I don't like what the Muslims are doing to people, the Christians. I don't like what's happening up in Washington. The Christians are coming under attack. But God said, love your enemy. They're your enemy. Love them into the kingdom. And so we're supposed to love our enemy. That's what Jesus, he said, what, what he did on the cross. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Second thing he said was to the thief. Somebody said to me one time, come to me if you could pick to come to me if you could pick anybody in the in the Bible to uh, go where they're going, where they're at, who would you pick? I said, Well, I'd have to think about it, but I know one that's there. If Jesus was hanging there beside a cross beside a thief on the cross, and this thief said, Lord, remember me when you come in your kingdom. Whew. Most important thing he ever said. And instantly he got a reply and he said, Jesus said, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Amen. Hallelujah. We know where that man is. We know he's with Christ forever. So if I had to make a quick choice, I'd say I want to be where the thief is. Because I know he's with Jesus. Jesus said, today you shall be with me in paradise. The two thieves on the cross represented humanity. Both of them together represented in the entire human race. One that wants God and wants to be with the Lord. And the others that all he wanted to do was be take it down off the cross and live a little longer in sin down here. So some people, we had a lady come in for prayer one time in the service and the guy that was, I was there in the service but I wasn't preaching and the guy that was preaching, he was praying for the sick and many were being touched and healed right there in front of us. It's a wonderful thing. And she came up and she said, would you pray for my legs to be healed? And he said, no ma'am, I won't. Mm. So I, I, my ears went, Whoop. I want to see what he's what, what he's, he's going to tell her. He said, "No, I won't, ma'am." She said, "Why?" He said, "Because God's told me that you want to be healed for one reason." A revelation from God while He was praying for people he said, "You want to have legs, your legs healed, so you can go out in the honky tonks and the bars and the dance floors and dance in the world." And she said, "Yeah, that's what I want to do." God said in his word, if we ask for him to if we meet a need so we can sin, he said, I won't, I won't do that. I won't answer that prayer. And that's the first time I've ever seen that happen. But he didn't pray for it. She left her unhealed because she wanted to consume it upon her own lust. She wanted to do the things that God didn't want her to do. She wanted to sin. Thou shalt be with, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. The Bible says in Romans 10, 13, what does that say? Nobody knows. Okay. Any of you ever listen to Pearline? 
Do you never hear a say what Romans 10, 13 says? Donnie says it. I say it. Tim says it. Kevin says it. People on prayer line. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now you know it. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. This thief said, Lord, will you remember me when you come in your kingdom? He called on the Lord and God answered him and he fulfilled that scripture there that was yet to be written. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And he got saved that day. Oh, praise God. And you, I just want, I don't want to keep going on, but can you imagine? I've thought about it many times. What did he feel after Jesus said, Today you will be with me in paradise? What did he feel? Do you think he just let out a long breath? He said, Praise God. Break my legs so I can die quicker. They were about to come and break their legs. I want to die. I'm ready to go. When you, when, you're, when you have Christ in your heart, Mark, you don't fear death. I can tell you today, with God hearing me, I don't fear death today. I did before I was saved, but I don't now. Because if I drop dead while I'm preaching, Brother Donnie can get up here and finish the message, or Kevin or Tim, and just give an invitation. Say, don't worry about him. If you want to see him, you got to look up there. He's not here anymore. Look north. Bible said he's not in the east, west, or south, but he says he's in the north. The third thing he said before 12 o'clock, now notice those things, Father, forgive him, great thing. Today thou shalt be with paradise, great thing. Next thing he said, woman, behold thy son. And he looks at John and says, behold thy mother. He was doing the fifth commandment, what the fifth commandment said to do. He said, it says, honor thy father and thy mother. And he was making sure that his mother would be taken care of after he was gone. His mother was so important to him. He said all these three things before the sixth hour, which is 12 noon. And now the skies are darkened and things are getting black. And it's really, the winds are blowing. The, the darkness is settling in over like probably no garden, it, it happened so fast. I can't imagine what was going through with soldiers and all the people around the book. Look, like this is dark here. It was rolling, darkness was coming in. And it was starting to rain. And there was an earthquake. Now we go to the other four things after 12 o'clock. Now notice how they change. Mark 15, 33 says, When the sixth hour was come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. Hour in the ninth hour, he spoke the last four things that he said. My God! My God! Why hast thou forsaken me? Amen. Notice the difference? From before and after. My God, my God, why himself forsaken me? The exact words that David said would happen in, uh, he spoke in Psalm 22, 1, when he said the same words, my God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? And, I, and folks, I don't know if David knew it was prophetic or not, but that's the words that Jesus Christ said on the cross. The darkness that began to descend on the earth at that time was representative of what was happening to Jesus. The darkness, the blackness was representative of what was happening to Jesus in him right that moment. The kingdom of darkness, Satan's kingdom, was overcoming Jesus. It was what happens when sin takes over our lives. It was at the time, at that time that God was placing the sins of the world upon Jesus. Things were not only darkened in, in, the, in the physical and out in the sky, but they were going dark in him. 
And if you read Isaiah 53, 12, or Hebrews 9, 28, or John 1, 9, 1, 29, you read that God was placing the sins of the world. But he became sin that we could become the righteousness of God. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. The time of darkness was the time that the sins of the world were being placed on Christ and it was killing him. Sin kills. When, when lust is conceived, it brings forth sin. And when sin is finished, it brings forth death. We can't comprehend, and I don't think we can fully understand what happened, what's happening. But God, in some way, somehow, was taking every sin that ever be committed and it would be committed and putting him on Christ. Your sins. I look at him today and I say, I'm so sorry, God. Jesus, I did to you what I did. I'm sorry that my sins cost you your life. But thank God he went there for us. Had he not been, we'd all be lost. And at that time, when Jesus said, my God, my God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? Jesus meant what he said. I don't care what people tell me. I have all kinds of people come up to me and say, well, that didn't mean that, that don't mean that. Like, it's leave it alone, you're wasting your breath. Because if God's word says it, I believe it, and I don't care what anybody says. I believe what it says. He said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken him? Because God has forsaken him. He put the sins of the world upon him and turned his back on his son. All of this was, was, he was going through it, Jesus was for you and me. Yeah. That's why judgment's going to be bad. Because all of us that know this, and we end up in that you're like no judgment, it's not going to be good. God said, Oh, you know all this, and, and people knew this, and they and they and they spit in my face. And I don't want to do what you got, I don't care what you did. Darkness was coming in because sin was being placed on Christ. Now, I don't know if you understand this or not, but Jesus was the divine Son of God. He was divine. He was the divine Son of God. And on that cross, Jesus was having the sins of the world placed. My son, don't get his photograph of me. I've got to give him away. He was taking the sins of the world upon him and he was dying. And we see just a few minutes later, a little bit later, he dies completely. And when he did, Sam, it was for you. Amen. And if you'd have been the only person that had ever need ever needed him to come. He said, I've got to go for Sam because he don't have a chance without me. Kevin, yeah, done it for you. Done it for me. He done it for everybody in here. And he died. When he died, you can believe this or not. I, I know it's true. You just don't try to change it. When he died, a part of the Godhead was gone. Jesus was dead. And two thirds of the Godhead still existed, but one third was gone. God the Son was gone. The throne beside the Father was vacant. And the one that normally sit on it was dead. Whew. What he went through for us. And then the fifth thing he said was, I thirst. He was so dehydrated, Jesus was, and that's found in John 19, 28. He was so dehydrated that every part of, his, of him craves fluid. He was so dehydrated that he just craved something fluid. But, please hear this. 
please give me just a minute or two and I'll explain this point. But is it possible that he was thirsting for more than just water? God showed this to me, and I couldn't hardly believe it when he showed it to me. He was the righteous, righteousness of God. He was God's righteousness manifest, manifested in flesh. Do you believe that? Amen. Some do, okay. Between 12 and 3, he was emptied of all unrighteousness, all righteousness. And was made sin. Now think of this. He was the righteousness of God. But on the cross from 12 to 3. God removed all the righteousness. And replaced it with sin. Now it's hard. Is, is it hard for you? To, it's hard for me to comprehend some of this. But is it possible he was craving more than just water? Listen, he was being emptied of all righteousness and being made sin. Was it possible that he was craving, thirsting for that righteousness that had been taken away? Matthew 5, 16, 5, 6. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst and thirst and thirst for what? Righteousness. So there is something in us that can cause us to thirst for righteousness. And I believe besides what he was craving in his body, I believe inwardly that righteousness being removed from him was so horrible for him, so hard, he never experienced anything like it. And I think he was thirsting for the righteousness of God to come back. But he became sin that you and I could become the righteousness of God. Amen. The sixth thing he said was, it is finished. In John 19, 30, He said, it is finished. That, I used to wonder, Lord, what do you mean by that? And then finally the Lord showed me several years ago. He showed me. It's very simple. He said, it is finished. In John, the sixth chapter, in verse 38, Jesus said, I have come to do the will of the Father. I've come, John 6, 38. I've come to do the will of the Father. Now I'm going to tell you, and he summed up in that one statement, that one verse, everything that he come to do. His main purpose for coming, his, his uh, only purpose, or a lot of things he come to down the cross, down the cross, I hear it all time. yes he did, but that was not his main reason for coming. His main reason for coming was to do the will of the Father. God said, go, son, and do my will from the start to the end, from your birth all the way to the end. And part of that will was to die on the cross for us. But when he said it is finished, he was looking up to the Father and saying, I have finished all that you sent me to do. From my birth to this very moment, I've done nothing but your will. I have finished all that you came, that you sent me to do. It is finished. He had fulfilled all that God told him to do. That's what he meant when he said it's finished. And then the last thing he said was, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Luke 23, 46. Then he died. He endured to the end until he let out that last breath and he was gone. We don't know a lot about what happened after Jesus' death, but we have a couple of things that we do know from the scriptures. 
Now, what I'm about to say, many disagree with. I'm hearing more and more preachers say that it didn't mean what it said in the scriptures. But I believe it did. It does. We know that he went to hell. The scriptures tell us he went to hell. In Psalm 16.10 and in Acts 2.27 it tells us that God did not let Jesus stay in hell. Hell is a place of great suffering. I believe he took our judgment. Jesus, when he went to hell, I believe he took our judgment and paid for our sins. I believe he suffered pain for every person who lived who lived or ever would live. I believe he took the place of the human race in hell. I personally believe that he took the punishment of every person. Do you believe he took your punishment? In hell? Did he take yours? 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 So he so we could go all around his room and you could go to every person in the world and say, Did he take yours? Since they believe so yeah, he did. So he took the punishment and judgment for everybody on this earth. Can you imagine? The punishment of one person is bad. How would you the hell is so bad you can't you can't explain how horrible it is just for one person. But what about having to take the pain of approximately twelve billion people? They say before this world's over. You know, they think that there'll be a total of 12 billion people that would have lived in this world. How would you like to have to take the pain for all 12 billion? That wouldn't feel good. It wouldn't be to be bad just for you. But really, it would be horrible for all that. And that's why I believe when Satan goes to hell, I'm thrown into the lake of fire. You see, there's depths to this thing. There's degrees. And I believe if you want to find Satan, you've got to go all the way to the very bottom. There, down there, for eternity. And I'm so glad. Down there, for eternity, Satan is going to have to look up to 12 billion, almost 12 billion souls, and take the pain and punishment for all of them. Hallelujah. Well, that'll make me want to run. I'm not kidding. Hey, it's the Lord. Back to said, I said, Lord, I'm on the front row seat on that one. When you throw him in, he said, everybody's going to see it the same way. We don't know a lot about what happened, but we know he went to hell. And then the Bible tells us when he went down into the chasms of the earth, the this is my personal belief. I do not believe that paradise was in heaven. I believe it was in the middle of the earth in a great a gate in a cross of hell and a great gulf between the two. I believe this is what God's word teaches. And the Bible said he went and preached to those in the lower part of the earth where paradise was. And those people needed to hear the gospel because we can only get to heaven through Jesus. <laughs> And those people that never had the opportunity who died believing in the Lord and trusting God, they never had the opportunity to accept Christ because they had died yet. So he went and preached the gospel. And he says he let them all out. Hallelujah. Praise God. Let them all out. A few of them, Jerry. <laughs> a few of them let them, had to make a stop on the way to heaven. They did. Don't you remember when it says Jesus was resurrected? The power of God was so strong in the place where he was, it saturated the whole area. People come out of the graves that had been in the graves for years. Yeah, they were believers in God. They came out of the graves and said they walked into the city. Hey, hey, ready? Ready? Margaret! Margaret! You're dead! Not anymore. Hallelujah! I've been touched by the resurrection power of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and I'm alive forevermore. Praise God. Ain't God good? God is good. Yes, He is. And then the resurrection. 
And there's one thing, there's one thing that Satan did not want. Out of all he knew was going to happen, there's one thing he didn't want. He did everything he could to stop it. He planted his soldiers all around the tomb. He put a rock there. He, he had people making sure nobody come around and he got to the rock and tried to uh, stall it and roll it away. He's ignorant. He ain't got no brains. He don't have any. Jesus smashed them out, crushed them, uh, stomped them out on the cross. He's ignorant. But all that he did, he couldn't stop Jesus from coming out of that tomb. And when Mary and Martha and some of the others, Mary and Mary Magdalene and some of the, Salome and some of those came to the tomb on Sunday morning. The Bible says an angel rolled up a stone out of the way. And I heard a preacher say something the other day was ignorant too, but we preachers are pretty ignorant sometimes because we don't study the word. If I give you a false something, it's not it's contrary to the words because I didn't study like I should. And so he said the uh, angel rolled the stone away so Jesus could get out. <laughs> You laugh because you're not ignorant, don't you? Ignorant of the word. He said, uh, someone had to be rolled away so Jesus could ask him. Well, they did something. They were there when they rolled the stone away. He didn't, come, he didn't come walking out. But they walked in. The stone was removed, not to let Jesus out, but to let us in and to be able to say, look, see, he's gone. It's empty. He is not here, the angel said. For he has risen. Amen. Praise God. Mm. Mary looked at him and said, Where have you laid it? Oh, in the garden. Mm -hmm. Boy, I don't know how people can keep him having holy little steps. See, he's not here. He's risen. Then she sees him standing outside the tomb. And uh, I'm, I'm shorting this. And he's. And uh, she, she, she thought he was a gardener. And then when he spoke to her, when Jesus speaks to you, it's like nobody else can speak to you. Isn't it? It's different. It's different. And you don't have to ask who it is, Jerry. Exactly. You don't have to ask. He spoke to her. She, oh, Master. It was live. She did what I probably got. Hug on, run it! And Red telling his disciples, he's no longer dead, he's alive. Amen. Well, you're crazy. We seen him die, seen him be buried, wouldn't it? In that uh, tomb or in that uh, place where they buried him. He's alive, folks. Yeah. And you can be glad today that you serve a risen Savior. The thing that makes the difference between us and all Christianity and all other religions is all them other religions, and I'm looking right at that camera, and I want everybody that's going to be seeing this on Facebook later, I wouldn't put it on because I'd be ashamed to show that. I'm a dad freaks, but... <laughs> I want you people to know, whoever you are, that if you're serving some kind of Messiah that hasn't risen from the dead, you're, in the, you're serving the wrong thing. Amen. The wrong person. The only one in the world, Christianity, is the only one that has a living Savior, a resurrected Savior. And if you're saved today, he lives right down there in your heart. Amen. Praise God. Father, thank you for, Lord, your word that tells us that we serve a living Savior. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your blessings on us. Thank you, God, for, uh, for all that you've done for us. Thank you, Lord, Jesus, for dying for us on the cross. Thank you. Thank you for all that you went through for us. Thank you for all the, the, the price you paid for us. Thank you that you come out of that grave three days later. And it says to never die again to live forevermore, never to die again. 
And that means when we're in you, we're not going to die either. We're going to shed this old body off one of these days. It's just a cold. It's a dungeon we're in that keeps us from coming on and being with you. But one of these days, we're going to discard this body. It's going to be laying on the ground and in a, uh, and it's going to be uh, laying in a casket somewhere. It's going to be laying out six feet under the ground. But that's not us. That was just the body we were in. If they want to see us, people do. They got to look up. Because that's where we'll be with Jesus. <laughs>